I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to stick with my prepared talk on what the Buddha was talking about with wise effort. And then we can apply that, if you like, to particular things. And whether it's making right effort with regard to our own physical health or making right efforts in our minds uh, with regard to our response to wars in different parts of the world, which are weighing on the hearts of many, many people, me included. We don't have to get political or anything when we talk about these things. We can simply apply the Buddha's uh, coaching, his recommendations to different areas of our lives and see if his teachings have value. So let's dive in. Uh, you may know that I've been doing an exploration of wise effort, one of the elements of the Eightfold Path, sometimes translated as right effort. I've actually come to feel that right effort, the word right, applied to right view, right intention, right speech, and so forth, is actually a little better translated translation than wise. Wise is good, but it kind of lacks that edge of the teacher who says, this is the right way. See for yourself, but I'm telling you, I think it's the right way. You know, <laughs> there's a certain edge to it. So whether you like right or wise or pick another word, good, I don't know, uh, we're going to talk about effort tonight, one of the elements of the Eightfold Path. And so I'm going to put into the chat um, the complete quotation. Huh? I don't have an answer. See, I warned you, iPhone starts talking, right? Even though I've turned off these things. Goodness. I beg your pardon for that. Crazy. Okay. Let's see here. I am now going to copy and paste the basic teaching of the Buddha about right effort. Hopefully the entire quotation, good, will be placed here. Okay? So this is the whole summary, the pithy summary, uh, in the section of the Pali Canon, the early teachings of the Buddha, uh, in the language of Pali, that summarizes what he means by right effort. I'll read the whole thing. And what is right effort? By the way, I've, I've adapted this and updated some of the sexist and um, monastic type language, but the essence I think is true to the, to the spirit, certainly, and even the letter of what the Buddha was saying. What is, what is right effort? You, you, generate a des, you generate desire for the non-arising of unarisen, harmful, unwholesome states. You make an effort, arouse energy, apply your mind, and strive. I think it's helpful to think about specific words, like a doctor's prescription. The Buddha was sometimes described as a doctor. Um, I just went rock climbing on Tuesday last week, and I had a guide. I think about the words of my guide. There are direct instructions or suggestions pointing out more or less skillful or unskillful ways to do things. We can think of these words here from the Buddha in that way. You make an effort, arouse energy, apply your mind, and strive. You generate desire also for the abandoning of arisen harmful unwholesome states. You make an effort, arouse energy, apply your mind, and strive. You generate desire for the arising of unarisen, unarisen wholesome states. You make an effort, arouse energy, apply your mind, and strive. Fourth, you generate desire for the continuation of arisen wholesome states, for their non-decline, increase, expansion, and fulfillment by development. 
You make an effort, arouse energy, apply your mind, and strive. This is called right effort. I want to fix a little error in the fourth of these, which I corrected as I read it. Whoops. I'm going to put the corrected version for number four in the chat. <clears throat> so what do we have here? We have four ways to help ourselves. Number one, prevent crud in the first place. Good idea. Number two, if stuff has arisen that is problematic for you, it's harmful, it's painful, it creates suffering, it harms you and others. That's what is meant essentially by unwholesome. If it's there, let it go. Third, promote the arising of the good stuff, that which is helpful that which is enjoyable, that which is beneficial to you and to others. Promote it arising. And fourth, whatever is good that is occurring in your, in your mind, whether as a present moment state or a trait that has been cultivated and is, and is in the background, do what you can to protect it to continue it, even to increase or expand it and fulfill it by development. The way I summarize this myself uh, is by adding an element that's kind of implicit. So we can um, prevent, reduce, or abandon that which is harmful and painful inside our being. Or in our actions of word and deed, okay? Prevent, decrease, release. Three good ways to deal with the crud. Alternately, we can create, preserve, or increase that which is beneficial, enjoyable, good for us and good for others. That's kind of the way to think about it. So let's bring this down to something concrete and practical. Let's take the very first one together. I'll put it in the chat. You generate desire for the non-arising, the prevention of not yet arisen problematic states of mind and extent by extension actions. Now let's explore that. First, you generate desire. That's interesting. It's like you decide, you choose that you kind of want to keep the crud out of your mind. It's not that you're at war with it, you're just wise. A good metaphor, I think, is that if you have a temple um, and you've swept it and it's clean and beautiful and very um, inspiring of practice, uh, you don't open the door so that a bunch of dust or rain or leaves or flies can come in. You guard the sense doors. That's is a traditional term. Uh, you, you just, you don't, uh, you don't, you make an intention. No, I don't want to ruminate about that. I don't want to get hijacked by my regrets. I don't want to get sucked into obsessing about my faults. Right. Uh, I don't want to let my mind be invaded 
by an addictive desire. So it's like you establish your, your stance. There's a kind of wholesome guardianship about your own mind. You say, you know, I don't want to let trouble in. <laughs> it may come in, but to the extent I can, I want to prevent it from coming in in the first place. I'm going to mobilize that as a desire. That's a goal. That's an aim. That's a want. It's a value. I like it. I like keeping the crud out. You're a gardener for your own mind. Your mind is a garden, right? You look at it. It's nice. It's nice. You uh, do things to keep the seeds of weeds away. And as 1969 asks, it, you're not resisting it, you are judiciously choosing it. It's kind of like maybe you're making a stew, lovely stew. You decide what goes in it, much as you decide in this way of looking at it, to some extent, you have power. Implicit here is that you have power over your own mind, to some extent, which is great. We're not totally helpless, all right? So you're making the stew, and... You get to decide, huh, I'm making a nice vegetarian tomato-based stew, and uh, do I want to put vanilla ice cream in it? No. <laughs> I'm not resisting vanilla ice cream. Maybe I'll have some later. But I choose to prevent it going into my vegetable, veg you know, tomato-based vegetable stew, because that would be kind of icky. So you're not fighting it. You're cho that's right, you're choosing, you're not resisting. Um, you might feel your feelings. This is, again, great, six, 1969. Uh, the feeling may arise of sadness or anger, fear, uh, inadequacy. The feelings themselves are not unwholesome. They're just there, right? They, they're there, so we're not fighting them. On the other hand, on the other hand, to, we have a lot of influence over the kind of feelings we invite into our own minds. If we start thinking about threats in an, in an obsessive way, guess what? Anxiety will follow. If we start being preoccupied with people who've wronged us, anger will follow. So there's a balance, obviously, where we think about things to respond effectively resiliently, morally, toward them. But past the point that's useful, why think about things that make you feel bad? Why think about things that preoccupy your mind? Why, why, why invite them into your inner temple, your inner garden? Kind of wild, right? To really just see the degree to which the Buddha is emphasizing um, you know, the, the power we have and the notion of generating desire. Um, I have found that one of the absolute most useful things for practice in this life is to help yourself learn to want things that are good for you and good for others that you don't yet really want. Teaching yourself to want what's beneficial is fantastic because that's sort of like the superpower. You're mobilizing genuine desire for something that's good for you that you don't yet have much desire for. And ways to do that, um, I've written about a lot, uh, one of the key ways to do that is to draw on classic uh, operant conditioning in, behavior, in behaviorism in which you associate reward with what you want to motivate. So, for example... If you want to generate desire for the non-arising of angry, helpless, obsessing about the state of politics in America, let's say, you would imagine how good it would feel to not have that invade your mind and remain. You might also imagine others who are politically engaged, they're awake, they understand what's happening, they're going to vote, they do what they can, but they don't obsess about it, they're not burdened by it. What might it be like to have more of their attitude or stance, and how good would that feel? 
for example. So now you're just starting to associate in this example, just one example, of reward to whatever you want to generate desire for. There are other ways to do it as well. There's a lot of material about how to develop new habits, how to motivate yourself, how to support yourself, right? But the basic idea is you're trying to help yourself want what's good for you, particularly in reference to protecting your own, your own being, your own heart, your own mind, your own body, your own life, okay? What are some examples of this for you? What And then what are you making an effort toward or arousing energy for and applying your mind and striving to kind of prevent in the first place? I'll tell you one thing I do to do this, I'm just thinking about this, um, over some years now, so I've been married a while, ups and downs and ups, and uh, one of the things I've kind of taken on <clears throat> more and more deliberately, so I've you know, generated desire for it, is to create kind of this background trickle of perspective on my wife as a really good person full of sincerity, dealt with some stuff in her own life that's been challenging and she's you know, had a good heart about it and just in there. So that's kind of like an ongoing background trickle of attitude about her that I sort of semi-deliberately uh, energize through making effort. And the energizing of that tends to prevent those little negative snarks from lasting more than a few seconds in my mind before they kind of dissipate, like snowflakes falling on a hot frying pan, cooking outside in Tibet, All right? So that's the thing. Uh, you might say to yourself, you know, I've, uh, I'm gonna, I regulate my news. I'm gonna watch that news show, one news show a day. I, I know someone who does that. They have their particular news show, they indulge that, and then when it's done, it's done, for example. Right? Um, yeah. So what are some of the ways that you protect your own mind? And try not to let a lot of stuff enter it. Uh, to be really clear, and I see Farah's comment at 59 minutes past the hour, we each make our own choices here. I'm cer I am certainly not recommending that we should not listen to any news or become ignorant. Personally, I actually think there's a strong moral value uh, in civic engagement to the extent that's possible in whatever country you're in. And so I'm, I'm all for that. And that for me boils down to um, having discernment about the actual facts, including sometimes a complex history, uh, having clear values, like a clear value on compassion and against violence, for example, and also then knowing what your actions are. Who are you going to vote for? Who do you support? What are you going to do? I'm, I'm all for that. I am just also saying that many people talk about being invaded by ruminations of various kinds. And I'm just suggesting that what the Buddha is talking about here is to generate desire to not be invaded by them in the first place. And then if we go to the second of the four major aspects of right effort. He goes on to say that, well, if the stuff has come up, it's there, you know, it's there, it's come up, do what you can to let it go, All right? You generate desire for the abandoning of harmful, unwholesome states. You make an effort with regard to them. You arouse energy, apply your mind and strive. You do this in a variety of ways. Often, one of the best ways is simply to be mindful of them. In the process of being mindful, 
suddenly we are less identified with them. We are more separated from them, and uh, we're we're not invaded by them. They're happening, but they're they don't have so much traction, and they are not getting reinforced in the brain. And then very often, with that mindful awareness and spaciousness, that which is problematic fades away. You could also engage a variety of methods that I summarize in the letting go um, aspects of my various practices. You can let go of tension in your body. You know, a calmer body generally produces a calmer mind. Uh, you can let the feelings flow. Maybe you really have gotten angry. And so, boom, boom, boom. It would help you to pound the table with the intention, arousing the desire of releasing, not fueling that fire. Maybe you deliberately challenge these little mutterings in your mind and look at them and go, that's not true. You're not right. I don't have to believe you. I don't believe that. That's not what I believe. I believe this. You know, you could, We could do various things, as the Buddha is pointing to. We can turn away. We can step out of the argument. We can... Um, Stop feeding that voice inside us that's yelling at us, right? There are a whole bunch of ways. Over time, psychologically, we can do trauma therapies or other kinds of practices that go down into the deeper roots in childhood of what generates, um, you know, this harmful, painful material. There are many, many ways we can do this. The Buddha is naming that this form of active, deliberate, brave, bold effort inside our mind and by extension in our behavior out into the world is thoroughly appropriate. We're not just to be swept along in a stream of non-dual awareness unless we're already so thoroughly enlightened that that's our truth. Otherwise, we need to make some efforts. Efforts are goal-directed. Oh my gosh, what a taboo. Goal-directed spiritual practice. Guess what? You know, spiritual practice is has a lot of goal-directedness in it, including the goals of gradually transcending goals. And then we have, right? So then we have the part that I especially like. What a surprise. Growing the good, okay? So here we've explored, of the three great practices, we have letting be, letting go, and letting in, okay? And in wise effort, we have the second, the second and third of these. We can be with the mind, we can work with the mind. Working with the mind has basically two aspects, right? Reduce what's problematic, and increase what's beneficial, okay? Now let's focus on how to increase what is beneficial. The Buddha says, you generate desire for the arising of unarisen wholesome states. Let's just pause right there. It's okay to want what's good for you. Wow. It's okay. It's good. It's right, according to the Buddha, to identify beneficial thoughts and attitudes, intentions, emotions, sensations, and activities that promote wholesome, beneficial thoughts and feelings and desires and so forth. It's okay to identify particular beneficial states of mind or beneficial acts of word or deed, to identify them and value them. The Buddha is saying, know what you value. In the first two elements that we've covered, know what you value, the prevention, reduction, or ending of. Here he is saying, know what you value, the creation, the um, perpetuation, and the increase of what you value, 
right? What are you trying to grow these days inside the garden of your mind? That's really good, you know? I, um, you know, I sometimes asked, you know, to kind of summarize a lot of material about taking in the good. I basically say, look, uh, alongside turning toward what is also good many times a day, feeling it and then receiving the experience of that into yourself to build up those beneficial traits. In addition to that, know one or more things that you're specifically working on these days. You're trying to grow. Right? Generate desire, healthy desire. Notice that desire, here's the Buddha, right? The great teacher of transcending desire. He's telling us to generate desire. It's because there's a difference between wholesome desire and Pali chanda. That's different from craving, tanha, rooted in the word for thirst. Wow. You know what I mean? I've just been in so many Buddhist circles that in which people, it seems like they haven't even, they, ha they haven't read the basics or they're, you know, they're not informed, but like, oh, does, you know, all desire is bad. Well, the Buddha is recommending that we generate desire for what helps us and others. All right. And then fourth, fourth element of the four. Whoops. So you might ask yourself, I encourage you to make a note to yourself if you like. Um, you know, if you want to bring this down to earth, of the four elements recommended by the Buddha, number one, write it down or say it to yourself or know, it, know what it is, maybe even declare it to another person who will support you. What do you want, to the extent you can, to prevent inhabiting your mind. Second, what tendencies do you have in your mind that you would like to reduce or even entirely let go of? Pick one, right? So two so far. Third, what? is not very present in your mind, and you would love to create it there. You would love to get it going. One thing, one thought, one feeling, one attitude, one intention, one knowing, what, okay? And then fourth, what's some of the good stuff that's already, already in you, either in the background or often in the foreground, what are some of the things you like about yourself? Oh, what a taboo question. Not. What do you like about yourself? What would you like to keep supporting? Maybe there are some parts of you, think of your you know, mind as containing many sub-personalities, kind of like an inner village or an inner committee, many different parts, different sub-personalities. And maybe some of them are, are kind of young and shy. And yet they're really sweet. They're really awesome. It'd be great to uh, you know bring them more forward. You could even apply this. We're in a couple of weeks entering into 2024 in the Western calendar. Um, you know what would you like to invite uh, to continue and even expand inside yourself this coming year? Right? And I love this. This line from him, fulfillment by development. Wow, how sweet. We fulfill it, we bring it into being by developing it. Isn't this great? The Buddha is basically saying, he wouldn't say this stuff if we couldn't do it, right? If we were robots, already pre-programmed, there's no point. A wise effort. You can't make an effort. You're programmed. You're a machine. But he's basically saying, you choose. You can generate desire for each of these four categories. And then as you've, then based on that desire that you've generated, you know, intention, motivation, passion, 
uh, valuing, understanding why it's good for you. Great. On the basis of generating that desire, what do you do? Right? You make an effort. You arouse actual energy toward that. You apply your mind and strive. Wow. How helpful. Okay? This is the basic teaching from the Buddha. See for yourself, like in all cases, what rings true to you? What's useful? Right? Um, yeah. Okay? Now, I really want to mess with us all. And I'm going to drop in something that might <coughs> seem completely contradictory from the great Dogen, Zen teacher, living in the 1200s in, in Japan and China. I read these two sentences on retreat a few months ago, a couple months ago, and they just pierced me like a bolt of lightning. Here you go. Read them slowly. Realize that this is a very careful translation from ancient Japanese. Uh, and we are entering into the mind stream of a very realized teacher who focused on the heart of the matter, the pith of the matter. I'll read the first sentence. Conveying oneself toward all things to carry out practice enlightenment is delusion. When I read that sentence, it reminded me of 50 years of goal-directed activity and accomplishment of various kinds, including a fair amount of striving in my personal practice. And yet the great Dogen is telling me that it's delusion. Whoa. And then in the second sentence, all things coming and carrying out practice enlightenment through the self is realization. For me, it feels like the difference between a top-down, directed pursuit of various goals, including seemingly good goals, that's different from being uh, surrendered to a kind of a rising current of reality moving through this particular person in healthy, effective activities. So it looks like, at first, Dogen is undermining the whole project of the Buddha in right effort. And we have here, historically, there are layers to this, if you're aware of this, of the critique coming from the Mahayana, especially Chan and then Zen, the critique of the goal-directed focus on individual effort in the early teachings, the original teachings of the Buddha. How do we put these together? It's a deep question, isn't it? And um, I hope it's okay that I'm laying this on the table. You know, I, I just have a bias toward, I'm sh sharing with you my practice and what I think of as um, deep matters that are not to be avoided. The resolution of this is, is a work in progress. But fundamentally, um, Dogen is saying that our understandable 
evolved, uh, conventional view of everything as separated, distinct, right? Here's my water bottle. It's distinct from my microphone, clunk, clunk. They're distinct. Both of these are distinct from my head, clunk, clunk, <laughs> right? That's the conventional view. It's true at a certain level, sometimes called relative reality. On the other hand, it's also true that there is a single universal universe in, in which everything is contained, certainly, as processes dynamically interacting, arising interdependently, as physical objects, simply passing patternings of the quantum foam, some of which last longer than others. That's the truth of things. And the sense of the separate I is, is a delusion. It's, it's incorrect. It's inaccurate. Right? That's the context in which Dogen is teaching us here. So the question then becomes, how? If that's true, and if the perpetuation of the sense of the separate I is a major source of our suffering, how do we engage the wise efforts of being a householder who gets up in the morning and puts on some clothes and eats and works and talks to others and does various things and then goes to bed and repeats it all the next day? How do we do that? How do you do it? My understanding in my practice, and also from <clears throat> Shohaku Okumura, whose wonderful book, Realizing Genjo Kwan, and I'm going to put that in the chat here, Realizing Genjo Kwan, may seem like technical and exotic. It's actually incredibly clear. I mean, one sentence at a time, opening your heart and blowing your mind. It's good stuff. From that teaching, in ways that seem real to me, and from Dogen as well, we can be deluded inside the frame of our enlightenment. In other words, inside the frame that we recognize the truth of, that all is really one, that everything is in a field of interbeing. Recognizing that and returning to that recognition, um, you know, again and again, inside the frame of that recognition, we can operate in various effective ways as a particular person who is making particular efforts. The Dogen talks about uh, some people are... Um, enlightened about their delusions. In other words, we can function as separated, distinct persons while knowing that the ultimate truth of things is interdependence, interbeing, one single universal reality. That's the combination of the two. And in that, um, I think it's really helpful. It's been incredibly helpful for me in the last three months since my retreat to again and again turn toward that embodied sense of, um, where am I here? The second sentence here. What's the embodied sense of all things coming and carrying out practice enlightenment, your own practice, through you? What's the sense of that? And so for me, it has these qualities of letting the game come to me more. That's kind of a sports term. Uh, it has a sense of receiving, letting it come rather than going out to get it. I very much know the embodied sense, you probably know it yourself, of top-down, goal-directed, uh, pursuit of one thing or another. What's it feel like 
to to be to have a sense that more things are supporting you they're working through you so that as you make these efforts you're kind of opening to that which is beneficial and helpful making efforts through you to prevent what's problematic and to foster what's helpful this all may seem very abstract it's okay it's really 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 worth chewing on you know which i recommend in um two steps right really look at what the buddha teaches i'll put the you know the right effort section in the chat again you're welcome to copy it you can copy it out of the chat and keep it or you can go look it up if you like um take a look at these four recommendations from the from the buddha and consider how you would apply them in your own life first of all um <clears throat> are you making efforts in ways that feel that they flow that are harmonious you know that are good i'll come back to that and then in particular take a look at okay what do you want to prevent what do you want to let go of what do you want to create and what do you want to protect and increase in your life that's a great checklist isn't it the buddha is endlessly practical all right so that's that's very solid i think we can all understand the words of right effort and we can apply them in practical ways we can apply them to our to our actions to our um to the words we use to our behaviors and we can also um apply them inside our own minds somebody asked me to type them again here they are Okay. Then <laughs> and this is this is Buddhism for you. Especially Zen. Oh my gosh. It's about pulling the rug out from under our feet in good ways. You know. And then we have Dogen. I'll try not to swear. What the heck, Dogen? You're like totally messing with us here. Here's Dogen again. I thought I put it in here. Hmm. Bear with me. Okay. I think Dogen is getting at our relationship to effort altogether. Right? And he's saying that you know if you get caught up in ego with the Buddha's four instructions that's trouble. If you emphasize the sense that you are some kind of a force acting on reality in a separated sense that's going to create trouble for you. That's good advice. if you um get caught up in vanity or arrogance or conceit about the results of your efforts excuse me i've been there <laughs> probably still am so i know i still am sometimes uh that's trouble okay right on the other hand if you relate to the buddha's instructions around efforts in a way that's more in dogen's second sentence in which there's a sense of things coming to you wholesome beneficial influences are moving toward you and through you as these efforts are being made that's a lot wiser and even in all that uh and and the a major aspect of that second sentence of things coming through is that we are giving the fruits of these efforts um we are dedicating the fruits of these efforts to everyone and we are engaging this process in ways that include a sense of 
loving kindness and service to all beings, right? Which, which naturally relaxes the contraction of self. So I invite you in practical terms as we finish here, in practical terms to look at those four instructions and think about how you would apply them in your own life, including, if you wish, in the year to come. And also rest with and kind of marinate in Dogen's very pithy two sentences and explore, huh, huh, would there be benefits for you and others into shifting more into the mode of that second sentence? of being lived by all things, all things coming and carrying out practice through you. Wow, that's pretty great. Okay, so um, that's it. Now that you understand everything, I'm so glad. <laughs> I like you, very good, Ole, I like that. Good. And um, so I'll be back next week. I invite you to return next week. You can even bring your friends. And what I'm going to do next week is kind of a grab bag sec session in which I zero in on questions about right effort so far. We've covered a lot of ground, deep material. And uh, so I'm very happy to get into lots of practicalities, messy issues with the in-laws, you name it, next week. Okay, so that is the end of my attempts at right effort with you tonight.